Welcome to the Insomnia Coach Podcast. My name is Martin Reed. I believe that nobody needs to live with chronic insomnia and that cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, CBTI techniques, can help you enjoy better sleep for the rest of your life. Eileen is a registered nurse of almost 30 years. She was always a light sleeper who felt that she needed perfect conditions for sleep to happen. After becoming a parent, she started to get less sleep and this triggered more sleep-related stress and worry that made sleep even more difficult. Before long, Eileen became totally focused on sleep and soon developed the mistaken belief that she just couldn't sleep. After seeking help from her physician, Eileen ended up on Ambien, a drug she took almost every day for 15 years. In this episode, Eileen describes how insomnia became part of her identity and how she went from constantly worrying about sleep and struggling with sleep to someone who now sleeps very well without sleeping pills. Eileen's willingness to implement cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, CBTI techniques, and her positive attitude helped her get to the point where she's now able to relax at night and let sleep happen naturally. Eileen no longer worries about sleep and, as a result, she is able to relax at night, get into bed, and sleep. A full transcript of this podcast can be found at insomniacoach.com forward slash podcast. Okay, Eileen, so thank you so much for being on with us today. Thank you for having me. So let's get the ball rolling here. Um, Can you tell us how long ago your sleep problems initially began and do you remember what initially triggered the sleep disruption? Well, I've always was a a light sleeper and uh, I had to have perfect conditions for me to go to sleep. Um, I couldn't sleep in a car or on a plane. I would have to be, you know, laying in bed and in the dark with no noise. Mm -hmm. And um, then when my kids were young, I noticed, you know, I'd be up a lot with them and I was getting less sleep. So I would start to stress about that. And then the more I stressed about it, the less sleep I was getting and the more I was concentrating on the hours I was in bed um, and not sleeping, the, the less sleep I was getting. It was a, just a vicious cycle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that is so common. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar if we ever discussed this, um, but we have this model for insomnia called the 3P model. Have you, have you heard of that? No, I haven't. Okay, so this is the model that we use to kind of describe how just this initial sleep disruption, how like a one-off night of bad sleep can kind of develop into a longer-term problem. And it's based on this idea that there are three Ps. Okay, so the first P uh, is this predisposing factor. The P stands for predisposing. And this can apply to people, you know, if we're light sleepers, like you just mentioned, if we're naturally light sleepers, we're more predisposed to sleep disruption. Um, if uh, we have a stressful job or if we're just more reactive to stress or anxiety or worry, um, or if we're really strong night hours or really strong morning larks, we can kind of progress onto this precipitating factor, you know, this event that makes this sleep disruption occur. So I would say that a big life change, um, even something more minor like an argument with a spouse just before bed that can lead to a bad night of sleep. Or in your case, like some a big life change, having children and then the children disrupt your sleep. You know, these are all these precipitating factors. Um, but again, we're still on to you know, just this initial short-term sleep disruption. Then we move into the third P, which is these perpetuating factors. And these are generally like all the things that we do in response to that understandable sleep disruption, but instead of that we do to try and get our sleep back on track, but they actually make it harder for our sleep to get back on track. They kind of perpetuate the problem. So this is often things like, you know, we go online and we start reading all about sleep. Um, We maybe 
look, look and explore different supplements for sleep. We start to really worry about sleep, maybe change our days, modify our plans in response to sleep, uh, go to bed earlier, stay in bed later, maybe try and nap or conserve energy and all these things that we do to try and get our sleep back on track actually perpetuate the problem. Um, so I, the reason I wanted to just give you an overview of that is because just from what you've said, it sounds like you kind of fit that model almost to a T. Did you recognize any of yourself or any of your experience in what I just went through there? Oh, definitely. And also I um, noticed that I totally focused on not sleeping and it consumed my mind and I would talk about it like I can't sleep I only got two mm. hours of sleep last night um, you know I'm a terrible sleeper I kind of um, said you know I'm an insomniac or I have insomnia I said those words a lot and I focused on that a lot and I put a lot of energy and a lot of negative talking into it mm -hmm. and also I just thought that my um, my father uh, was a poor sleeper and I just thought oh well it's just uh, in my genes and I mm. have been inherited it from my father. So it's something I just need to deal with myself. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I had gone to, uh, I sought help from my physician and, uh, she initially had, uh, given me Ambien mm -hmm. and I tried Ambien and, um, I use that almost every day for like 15 years. Wow. And some nights I still didn't even sleep because mm -hmm. I would lay there worrying about the time or how much time I was in bed or a little bit of sleep I was getting. Mm -hmm. So d during that time, do you feel, did you ever kind of develop this belief that if you didn't take the Ambien or whatever sleep medication it was you were taking at the time, did you have this belief that you kind of needed that in order to get any sleep at all? Or did you just feel like it wasn't effective in uh, whatsoever? Oh, I, I absolutely thought I needed to, um, to take that in order to sleep. Mm -hmm. I, I totally had convinced myself, you know, if my doctor has, has given this to me, it must be, you know, something that's going to help me and that, um, you know, I should be taking this. And even sometimes I had gone back and I said, you know, I'm trying to get off of this or, you know, I want to try something else. And she, she had just said, oh, just keep taking it. Take it every night. Oh. And I was like, wow, I'm going to take this every night. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and that was in the beginning. Um, and then she did try to then get me on to different things. I had to try different medications, uh, and, but none of those helped. Yeah. So I always went back to the Ambien. Yeah. So, yeah, they, I mean, it, it's really like a double edged sword. I feel like when you when you end up down that route with the sleep medications or even if it's not a prescription sleep medication, you know, supplements, even, um, you know, like melatonin or all, all, all of these different kind of sleep supplements that are on the market these days. Um, the big issue that I see when I work with people with insomnia is it's so easy to develop this belief that you can't sleep without them, that they're somehow generating sleep for you. Mm -hmm. When the only thing that generates sleep is our own internal sleep drive. You know, right. sometimes a medication can help you get over that initial barrier to sleep, which maybe is, let's say it's like a high level of anxiety. Sometimes that can give you some comfort to take a medication, slightly lower that anxiety, but it's still just your own body that's generating sleep. So it's really this slippery slope when you start to believe that there's this pill or this liquid or this tea or anything like that, that's actually generating sleep for you. That's right. Yeah. And I, I learned so much from your course that, you know, just the first um, tip that you gave was to get rid of your uh, clock. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't get rid of the clock, but I turned it around. And that alone, because you had you had said that you're focusing on the time and calculating the time and your brain is working. And I recognize that's exactly what I was doing. I was just calculating and and making my brain work and my brain was always in overdrive uh, when I would lay into lay in bed mm -hmm. and I used to always say that to people too I said my I can't stop the mind chatter it's just it's constant mm -hmm. and I was perpetuating that just by even talking about it yeah that that checking the clock it's just seems to be 
such a really simple behavior just you know just to suggest to people just try not checking the clock but it's one of the things that i get people come back to me and say that they recognize that as one of the most helpful things that they did which is kind of incredible when you think just that one relatively straightforward behavioral change can just have such a big impact yeah oh yeah that was a big deal for me yeah. Did did you have any hesitation about it when when I first suggested that? Did you think, oh no, I like the very thought of not checking the time is giving me anxiety, or were you kind of quite accepting of, of the idea behind it? Well, I was. I am totally time focused. I mean, I wear a watch all the time. I feel naked without a watch. Mm-hmm. I I I used to even sometimes uh, sleep with a watch that had a little uh, light on it. So if I wasn't facing the clock, I would press my watch on my wrist and I could see the time. Mm -hmm. I even had said uh, that I thought about purchasing the clock that projected the time on the ceiling. So I could see at any position I would be in bed. Wow. So getting rid of the clock for me was very hard, but I recognize it was very necessary. Mm-hmm. And like I said, I didn't get rid of it. I just turned it around so that I couldn't see it and I wouldn't yeah. be focusing on it. Mm-hmm. That was a big thing for me to get rid of that. And it, but it, it was a huge help and it yeah. was uh, the start of my uh, helping myself. So did you find it helpful like immediately as soon as you did it? Or did you find like you you kind of still had this ingrained habit, this urge and desire to check the time. So it, therefore it took you a while to accept not checking the clock. Like was it a big challenge for you in the short term or did you find like almost immediately it was helpful? I think, you know, in the very beginning it was a challenge, uh, but mm. then I'd have to, you know, tell my mind, you know, you can't think about that. And just, I know, um, you know, I just have to like turn over and not look at it Mm -hmm. and try to focus on something else. Yeah, absolutely. I I think that's a good idea. Like just trying to focus attention on something other than the time, you know, well, what, what kind of things did you kind of try and distract yourself with. Well, one of your tips was like, you know, to like do this like mind kind of thing where you um, focus on a back corner of your mind. And at first I was like, oh my gosh, this is so hokey, you know, <laughs> just, but I tried it and it really, it really helped. And I would just then um, turn my eyes kind of back and look in the back corner of my brain and really just try to focus on that little part of my brain. And that would, that helped also. Mm -hmm. And like I said, at first I didn't think that would do anything, but it did. It's kind of amazing how just some relatively small techniques or suggestions, you know, they can just be really effective at just distracting the mind. And I really think that because anxiety and a high level of arousal is such a big driver of sleep disruption, such a perpetuating factor, just finding something that helps distract you from just thinking about and worrying about sleep can be so helpful. And it can really be different from person to person. Like just as you found trying to focus on the the back of your mind or the back of your head was helpful for you. Um, Mm -hmm. For someone else, it might just be, you know, getting out of bed and just reading a book or even just watching TV for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, just to distract you from this endless cycle of just thinking about sleep and just checking to see if you're asleep and feeling frustrated that you're not asleep yet. I had also, you know, through your program learned that I would get into bed and I had trained myself to just start worrying And Mm -hmm. it was like I would lay in bed and my mind would go into overdrive. And I think about all the things that I had, you know, didn't get done that day and all the things that were going to pile up for the next day. And um, and that was like my routine. I'd lay in bed and then it would just start. My brain would just start. It just like I taught myself how to do that. Mm -hmm. And I recognized that. And I said, I really I I. I got to lay in bed and teach myself this is where you sleep, not where you worry. Mm -hmm. And it it took a while, but it was just recognizing those things that I was doing Mm -hmm. really, um, really helped. And it just pointed me in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So talking about that, how did you manage to 
to move on from that, you know, because a lot of people with insomnia will, I have no doubt, identify with what you're saying in terms of they get into bed and that's it. The mind just becomes really active, you know, and starts thinking about everything. You know, it could, it might not even be related to sleep. It just becomes really active. You start thinking about everything you need to do tomorrow. And there is also often a lot of sleep anxiety in there too. The, the whole process of relaxation, you know, um, it is such a big topic and it can be really hard to become really folk hyper-focused and really like spend almost spend too much time on it. Um, what I like to say and suggest when it comes to relaxation is obviously relaxation is important because we want to feel relaxed when we go to bed, right? Because it's an important part of the falling asleep process. Um, but really when it comes to what specifically to do, it really is just up to the individual and it should just be whatever you personally find relaxing and enjoyable, you know, because mm -hmm. like we just suggested earlier, there's, there's nothing that creates sleep apart from your biological sleep drive. Um, so it really is just, if you find something relaxing and enjoyable, you know, that's usually the best thing to do like an hour or so before you're planning on going to bed, just reserve that time for activities that you personally find relaxing and enjoyable. And I think really that's the best advice I have when it comes to relaxation. Right. Yes. <laughs> I agree. So, all right. So this was, it was quite a long time ago that you was, I think it was like four and a half years ago that uh, you, uh, you first started implementing these techniques to help improve your sleep. Um, you already talked a lot about some of the things that you learned. I think that the clock turned like not checking the clock you said was quite a big, big thing for you. Were there any specific techniques related to the cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, these CBTI techniques, you know, such as uh, allotting less time for sleep or getting out of bed when you couldn't sleep? Were there any techniques like that that you found helpful or that you tried? Uh, yes, I would get out of bed um, if I couldn't sleep. Um, you know, like you had said that, you know, don't lay in bed tossing and turning. Um, just get up, maybe um, go go out. I would go out to the living room and um, sit on a chair or on the couch and um, just until I started to fall, you know, get a little sleepier and then I'd go back into bed. And those tips also helped. And that was, um, you know, just again, like to train your brain that the bed is for sleeping. It's not for tossing and turning and worrying. Mm -hmm. It's just training yourself. And it's, you know, um, that's, I always say, like, I, I'm a nurse and I always tell patients, I say, your brain is very powerful. It can hurt you and it can heal you. And I wasn't taking those words myself. Mm -hmm. I was, but I, I really was, I was hurting my brain by, you know, just worrying and tossing and turning and keeping my brain going. I was hurting myself, but then I learned how to, you know, change that and turn it around so that I could heal my, myself. Yeah. Yeah, it can be such a powerful technique, uh, just the process of getting out of bed when, when you can't sleep. Um, but it's one of these techniques that sounds completely counterintuitive when you hear it, right? How, how yeah. does getting out of bed, how is the idea of getting out of bed, how's that going to lead to more sleep? How's that going to help me improve my sleep? Um, so did, when you first heard about this technique, did you have any reservations about it or any concerns about it before you started to implement that? Yeah, I thought, you know, how could this help? You know, yeah, you're getting out of bed. How could this be of, of, of any help? But the, and the other thing, too, was like not concentrating so much on how many hours of sleep I was getting, but thinking more about, you know, where they restful hours of sleep and not so much the time in bed. It was just, um, it was just changing my thinking about what things would work and what wouldn't work is really yeah. what it did. Yeah. Well, one of the, there's a couple of uh, really common objections that I hear in relation to the idea of getting out of bed when you can't sleep. Um, one of them is the idea of getting out of bed. That's just going to leave me feeling more awake, you know, because I'm in bed. Maybe I'm going to 
maybe there's a chance I'll fall asleep, but if I get out of bed, I'm going to feel wide awake and then I'm going to struggle. And the other one is some people just feel that just the very thought of getting out of bed get, makes them feel worried. And therefore that they just think I can't follow through. This is just going to be too difficult for me. Do you identify with any of those objections? And if you do, how did you get past them yourself? Well, I was willing to give anything a try. Mm -hmm. So I would get out of bed and, um, you know, try, you know, reading and till I would get a little sleepier and then get back into bed. And um, I didn't think it would, would work, but I found that it did work. Mm. You know, I think that's key is just you're willing to give it a try and just willing to experiment with it. A lot of the times, um, if I'm talking about some CBTI techniques with people and they, they object to it, I encourage them just to, instead of thinking this is something that you're going to have to do and force yourself to endure, how about just doing an experiment? You know, give yourself right. one or two weeks and just go all in and really commit to it. And then after the week or two, then evaluate and just see, has it had any effect? Because really, unless you really commit to it and give it a couple of weeks, you're, you're really, you'll never know, you know? Right. That's exactly it. If you try it, you know, just, I, I didn't think um, turning the clock around or stop thinking about the clock would do anything until I actually did it. And wow, this was huge. So I thought, okay, I'll give something else a try that I didn't think would help. And it helped. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, I think that's key, you know, just, just the willingness. I really think that so much of it is just down to our willingness to try. And it really does come a lot down to attitude as well. Like if you have this positive attitude, which can be hard when you've lived with insomnia for so long, but if you're just willing to embrace and experiment with new techniques, um, often that's more than half the battle is just that willingness to try new things. Um, because after all, you know that what you've been doing up to this point hasn't been working. So why not try something that for many, many people has proven to be effective and helpful. Yeah, because most of most people like um, physicians and on television, um, you know, the television ads will say, if you have trouble sleeping, take, you know, this PM medicine and uh, or there's other, um, you know, sleep aids. They so they make it sound like having trouble sleeping is normal and just the way to, to fix it is to take a pill. Mm -hmm. And that's the only thing that you hear um, in our world today is just like, okay, this is your problem and this is how you fix it. You take a pill. Mm -hmm. And that's it. So everybody thinks that's the only way you can fix it. Yeah, it is, it, it is a problem that, that there's more money behind the, the medications than there is behind techniques like CBTI. Um, and I think, on top of that, the big problem is is these CBTI techniques. They do take some, they take well some. They take a lot of effort and commitment. You know, especially if you've been living with insomnia for a long time and your insomnia is really entrenched, it can take time, and you have to be so consistent and committed to the techniques in order to get the benefits from them. Uh, whereas the big selling point of the sleeping pills is kind of you don't have to worry about any of that, right? You just pop a pill. And then very easy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think that that is another thing that we're kind of up against when we're talking about changing the way you think about sleep and changing your sleep related behaviors, because that just takes so much more effort. But I think that in the long term, it really, really is worth worth that effort. Yeah. And we are a, um, a society that wants things instantly. Mm. We don't want to put the time and effort into, you know, it's, it's, it's an effort to you know, do a training and it's, a, you can't see the results immediately. And we are used to having immediate results. Yeah. Yeah. I could, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more with you. So, okay. So let, let, let's wind back a little bit. So you, you're always a light sleeper, you know, you, your sleep got disrupted when you, when you had your children, um, you already mentioned that you were on Ambien for 15 years. Um, so it, it's clear that insomnia was a very real problem for you. And it was obviously a big part of your life. Um, I understand that 
well, you've already mentioned that you work in the health field yourself. You're a registered nurse. Um, I think a lot of people listening to this would think, well, as a registered nurse, surely you already knew about CBTI techniques and you had all the skills and the support that you needed to get your sleep back on track. So what would you say in response to that? Uh, I would say I did not know about um, CBI uh, training until I did like searches on the internet and found your site. Mm -hmm. Um, nobody really, nobody had offered, uh, that solution to me in the medical, uh, field. Mm -hmm. It was either take this pill or don't take it and you'll don't take any pills and you'll fall asleep eventually. And nobody, they, they, there was no in between, there was no other, uh, alternatives for my, um, sleep problems. Mm -hmm. And I find that, you know, this is something that I had to do, you know, search out on my own. And I, I thank God that I found it because it has changed my sleeping dramatically, but it's like that more people need to hear about it and the medical community needs to know about it. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And I think in a way you were very lucky that you found out about CBTI techniques when you did a search because so much of the stuff, if we just type in, you know, how to, how to fall asleep, how to beat insomnia, all this stuff onto Google. First of all, there's a lot of kind of this sleep hygiene advice comes back, which generally isn't all that helpful for people with chronic insomnia, because I like to think of sleep hygiene as kind of like dental hygiene. It's more to do with prevention of sleep problems. But once you've got to that point where sleep is now an issue, it's kind of a bit late for, for the sleep hygiene advice, but right. also you get, you get all these search results coming up, you know, with all these really sensationalized media articles about if you sleep less than X number of hours, this will happen to you. Or if you don't sleep like this, this will happen. And that can just really raise your sleep related worry and anxiety and just, make you put all your efforts and attention into stuff that's not helpful and not constructive and isn't really going to help you get your sleep back on track. Yes. Worrying about, you know, all of those things do not help. Yeah. I've tried that. Yeah, absolutely. So you, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, the, the sleeping pills? Because a lot of people listening to this, they're going to either be taking them now or they've taken them in the past. And I understand, are you taking sleeping pills at all anymore or are you? Completely no, off no, them? not at all. Not at all. Nothing. Um, yeah. So, so how did you get to that point? That, that's the simple question. How did you get from taking Ambien for 15 years and having the real belief that if you didn't take Ambien, you would never sleep to where you are now, where you don't take sleeping pills? Like, how did you get there? I, I kind of, I had to like do a trial kind of uh, basis. Like in the beginning, I, um, on days that I didn't have to work the next day, I would uh, not take it and mm -hmm. see what would happen. And I would, you know, just kind of push through it. And then like over on the weekends, I would not take it. And eventually it was just like I started to sleep and I noticed that I didn't need to take the Ambien. Mm -hmm. And so I just kind of cut it out. Um, and also, I, I guess also my doctor at the time too was not liking that I was on Ambien all the time. She kind of changed. She went from take it every night to, oh, maybe you shouldn't be taking this. Hmm. But she didn't offer anything else. So I was like, well, I... I've got to just get myself off of this because, um, and I got to figure out something else, mm -hmm. you know, to do to help with my sleep. So I kind of just said, this is going to be it. And I'm going to do this training and I stuck with it. And I, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, it took a little bit, it didn't like happen overnight, uh, but it did definitely start to work. Mm -hmm. So did you find the, like on that first night where you decided that you weren't going to take any medication that night, what was that night like for you? Was that difficult or was it easy? Well, I had just made up my mind. I have functioned with two hours or less of sleep before. I'll just do it again. Mm. <laughs> so I just made up my mind. I'm doing something to help me and this is going to, this is going to work. Mm -hmm. So stick with it. 
Yeah. And what was that? How did you feel on that first day when you woke up um, after a decent night of sleep and you hadn't taken any medication? What, what was that feeling like? Oh, wow. Um, I can't, let me think. I'm trying, I'm sure I felt great, but it was, mm. I don't think it just happened. Like it, it I kind of weaned into it. So yeah. I don't remember exactly like that first time. Oh my, I slept through the night. Mm-hmm. I don't remember like when that happened, but, mm-hmm. it, but I'm, yeah. I'm glad I don't have to rely on um, sleep med- medication. Yeah, I think it is important to recognize that it is a process, you know, and the, that's why I'm so happy that you said it didn't happen overnight. You know, it was a process and it took me time um, because it it's so easy if if you're kind of you're at that point where you want to come off the sleeping medication very often. You know, when you first start to either taper off or you hit that first night where you're not taking it, it's quite normal for sleep to be disrupted, you know, because you're actually more alert looking for looking for the results of the fact that you haven't taken anything you know you've removed that crutch so it's quite normal and natural for sleep to be more disrupted on that night so i also thought it was interesting how you mentioned that you started off doing it on the nights where there would be less pressure you know so you do it on a weekend night or a night where you knew you didn't have to go to work the next day but at the same time you reminded yourself that look Hey, even if I do only get a couple of hours sleep, I've got through the day before on only a couple of hours sleep. So it's not as big of a deal as perhaps I might first think or worry that it might be. That's right. It's, it's what you like tell yourself too. And I learned that too. Like, like I said, you know, I was telling myself I'm I'm in an insomniac. I am a terrible sleeper. I can't sleep with this, 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 or that. I told myself those things. So I knew I had to change my thinking to, yes, I can do this. I'll Mm -hmm. be able to do this. This will work. And to think positively about it. Yep. That positive attitude or just the willingness to be a little bit more open-minded or just to try something new. So much of of success, I think, is just down to that. And I, I really do think that a lot of a, a lot of you know the contributing factors to success are, are just about attitude and willingness to try something different. Yes. Oh, definitely. And it's with anything. It's if it- it's not easy in the beginning, but if you stick with it, um, it is definitely worth it. Yeah. So do you kind of recall, because I know it was a few years ago now, but do you recall roughly how long it was from when you started implementing CBTI techniques to when you got to the point where you felt more comfortable in your ability to sleep? you know, kind of didn't really think of yourself as someone with insomnia anymore and didn't really think about sleep that much? Um, again, it didn't happen overnight. It was mm-hmm. probably, you know, a couple of months before I totally was like, wow, I can go to sleep on my own. So, I yeah. mean, it was, it took a while, but I don't remember exactly like how it just happened, but mm. it it did eventually. And it's, um, you know, it's just something that took a while, but it worked. Yeah, I think that's important to emphasize as well, that it is this gradual process. It's, it's very rare that someone just implements these CBTI techniques or, you know, like a lot less time for sleep or gets out of bed when they're struggling and within two or three days, they're suddenly transformed. It is important to emphasize that it is a process and it does take time, just like it took time for insomnia to develop and become entrenched. You know, it takes time to go back in there and kind of undo that process and help get your sleep back on track. That's a very good uh, point because yeah, it didn't happen overnight that I wasn't sleeping. It was a, uh, a long process that, of, you know, worrying and thinking and doing all these little things that were keeping my brain awake. And it it took a while, Mm -hmm. you know, it didn't, um, in the beginning, like years ago, I'd have trouble sleeping every now and then, but then it became, um, you know, a, a real problem where it was every night. Yeah. So yeah, it was a process to get to that point. So yes, it makes sense that it would be a process to get, you know, to change that. Yeah. So what, what's your sleep like now? How would you describe your sleep? 
Um, I sleep very well. I go into bed, um, so I'm not like pressured about I got to get to sleep. I just kind of um, get into bed and I, I just kind of turn off my brain and let sleep happen. I don't have to worry or force myself to go to sleep. Mm -hmm. I just kind of relax and let sleep happen. And before I was trying to force myself to go to sleep. Mm -hmm. you know, that doesn't now when I say that it doesn't even make sense but I would be like forcing myself to try to go to sleep before so just you know relaxing and, and falling asleep and not worrying about the time or um, I did in the beginning you know try to keep my sleep schedule pretty consistent but I've kind of fallen out of that habit because you know my um, my work schedule is different on some days I uh, start at different times and so even is now I don't have to keep like a strict sleep schedule to even mm -hmm. for me to fall asleep now but in the beginning I found that helpful too yeah I I see from what you're saying there it, to me it just sounds like it can all be summed up in the you just no longer have any sleep effort you know, you just make no more attempts to kind of control sleep or make yourself sleep. You don't even really think about sleep anymore. Does that sound accurate? Yep. That's, that's very, very accurate. Yeah. And I, that's where I think that's the kind of the breakthrough moment, you know, whenever I'm working with clients, that's always the goal that I want to have as that's where we want to get to, you know, that process of just not even thinking about sleep anymore. You wake up, you don't immediately reflect on how well or how poorly you slept, how many hours you got. You don't even give sleep any thought during the day. Um, and you certainly just don't try and control sleep. And as, as soon as you get to that point, you, you, I think it's a symptom of just having more confidence in your ability to sleep. You've got that confidence back that you can sleep. There's nothing broken with your sleep system. Mm -hmm. uh, and once you have that confidence back, you just naturally don't really pay any attention to sleep. And as soon as you get to that point, sleep just becomes so much easier. It does. Oh, definitely. <laughs> so much better. Yeah. So, so do you recognize any, um, any change in like your, your, your life during the day, you know, your quality of life, like how that's changed as a result of your sleep getting a, a little bit better? Um, I used to manage pretty well with little sleep mm -hmm. because I guess, you know, having lots of, you know, small kids at one time, you know, kind of prepped me for that to be up all night and up all day. And, and so I functioned, but there would be times when, it would snowball where if it was a, a lot of nights in a row that I um, hadn't gotten any sleep, it would get to a point where I, I would just say to my husband, I've got to go to bed early tonight, um, you know, even just to get on top of the um, two hours of tossing and turning before I would eventually fall asleep. I thought if I got into bed earlier, maybe I'd fall asleep mm -hmm. earlier. Um, and so it did affect me that way, but, um, most every day it, I just, um, kind of just got through it and just forced myself to get through it mm -hmm. until it got to the point where I just, I had to go to sleep. Then I just mm -hmm. said, I had to, you know, get some sleep and my husband doesn't have any trouble sleeping and he could not understand, like, how could you not sleep he just that didn't make any sense to him <laughs> so yeah. you know he could fall asleep anywhere so that was you know challenging it just didn't make any sense to him that i couldn't go to sleep yeah that is quite remarkable i think just from my own experience anecdotally i think that people with insomnia tend to pick or end up with partners that are remarkably excellent sleepers Yes. And that's the same with my mother and father. My mother could sleep anywhere and my father had trouble sleeping. So yeah. I, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. And you know, then the difficulty can become like you, you want to go to bed at the same time as your partner and get out of bed at the same time as your partner. Um, but if you go to bed, like you just alluded to earlier, when we go to bed before we're ready, which is actually quite 
quite common when we have insomnia. We, the idea that we go to bed early, we might get some more sleep. But the problem is if we're not sleepy enough for sleep, we're just not going to get any, <laughs> we're not going to end up falling asleep. Right. And also if we go to bed before we're sleepy, we can just lead, it just encourages this rumination, you know, that sleep related worries and thoughts, which actually can make sleep even more difficult compared to if you had to just wait a little bit longer. Um, and then you have that thing where you're just in bed awake and you just look to your partner and they're fast asleep. You know, they can just drive this resentment and just build up this more anxiety and more frustration and make sleep even more difficult. Yes. Oh yeah. And he's, my husband is more of a, um, early bird. He's four o'clock in the morning is like his time to shine. And that is not my time to shine. <laughs> if I had my way, I think I'd get out of bed at seven o'clock in the morning every day. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's more my time. And I would, I would stay up later than he would. Mm-hmm. So it's like, we're on, we're different anyway, even, mm-hmm. um, you know, before, you know, th- even when I don't have sleep troubles or when mm-hmm. I didn't have sleep troubles. Yeah. I think it's really important, especially um, when you have a spouse is just to try and follow your own sleep cycle, you know, not that of your partner. And so only go to bed when you feel sleepy, not necessarily right. when your partner feels sleepy um, and to work with an out of bedtime that works for you. Um, because, Ultimately, if you want to improve your sleep, you need to sleep how you want to sleep, not how your partner's sleeping. Um, it, it sounds pretty straightforward, but it's so easy to kind of fall into that trap, uh, especially when you have insomnia of just going to bed based on someone else's schedule rather than really paying attention to what a more appropriate schedule would be for you. Right. Yeah. All right, Eileen. Well, I really appreciate the amount of time that you've you, that you've put aside for us today. I just want to ask one more question for you. Um, if if someone with chronic insomnia is listening and feel feels as though they've tried everything, that they're beyond help, and that they can't do anything to improve their sleep, what would you tell them? Definitely give this a try, and that um, this if you put your put effort into it. It does take effort. If you put the effort into it, it will pay off and you will train yourself to fall asleep and you won't need any, like you had said, crutches like uh, sleep aids because they are a crutch um, and you won't need that crutch anymore and that you'll be able to get restful sleep if you try this. That's great. I think that's a really positive note to end on. So again, I really thank you for your time, Eileen. And thank you for sharing your story. I'm sure many people are going to find it really helpful. Thank you, Martin, for having me. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Insomnia Coach podcast. If you're ready to implement cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia CBTI techniques to improve your sleep, but think you might need some additional support and guidance, I would love to help. There are two ways we can work together. First, you can get my online coaching course. This is the most popular option. My course combines sleep education with unlimited support and guidance and is guaranteed to improve your sleep. I will teach you and help you implement new CBTI techniques over a period of eight weeks. This gives you time to build sleep confidence and notice results without feeling overwhelmed. You can get the course and start right now at insomniacoach.com forward slash online. I also offer a phone coaching package where we start with a one hour call. This can be voice only or video, your choice. And we come up with an initial two week plan that will have you implementing CBTI techniques that will lead to long-term improvements in your sleep. You get unlimited email-based support and guidance for two weeks after the call, along with a half-hour follow-up call at the end of the two weeks. You can book the phone coaching package at insomniacoach.com forward slash phone. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Insomnia Coach podcast. I'm Martin Reed, and 
As always, I'd like to leave you with this important reminder. You can sleep. <laughs>